I'm your host of News Inside, Kang Mi Eun, and I'm professor in the Department of Communication at Sung Myung Women's University. Uh, News Inside brings you the latest issues, and here we are joined by our panelists. On my left, Professor Shin Sang Hyop from the Graduate School of International Studies at Gyeonghee University. And on my right is Professor Lee Young Eun, and she's from the Department of Media Arts and Sciences at Korea National Open University. All right, before we start off our main discussion, let's take a look at this week's 60 second news update. President Park Geun-hye has returned from her 10-day multi-nation diplomatic tour after attending the G20 APEC and ASEAN summit. The Korean government received positive feedback for laying out a balanced and comprehensive diplomacy with the United States and China during the event. In particular, it was a big achievement for Korea as they were selected to host the APEC summit in 2025. Despite an overall slump in exports this year, the cosmetics, food and electronics market show an increase in exports. These products were praised by the global community for their creativity, consumer trust and expertise. On the 22nd, former President Kim myung sam passed away. His funeral was attended by mourners and politicians who came to pay their respects. President Park Geun-hye laid flowers on the late president's memorial altar and expressed her condolences. That was our 60-second news update for this week. This was an unfortunate event. At the late President Kim Young sams funeral, there was mourning not only from the political circle, but also from other social circles as well. And what was your thought about the funeral? Yes, I think it was remarkable how both political parties who had been quarreling violently in recent days uh, were both joined in uh, mourning uh, President Kim. And so I think he contributed to the reconciliation of the politics in Korea. Professor Shin, what was your Well, comment? personally, I think it's uh, very sorry to lose such a great political leader. Uh, as, as you know very well, he has contributed a lot to uh, uh, have the, uh, uh, improve the democracy in, in Korea. So uh, it's very, uh, uh, I mean, sad for us to lose him um, as, uh, because he was uh, one of the big heroes for right. us. Right. Now, let's begin our discussion for this week's News Insight. Upon the completion of the G20 Summit, the APEC Summit, and also the ASEAN Plus 3 cooperation with Korea, China, Japan, and Southeast Asian countries have also come to a conclusion. And let's discuss what was achieved at the APEC Summit and also from the ASEAN. What were the topics that President Park discussed this time around? Mm -hmm. She had a series of summit meetings uh, for the last uh, 10 days, I think. She uh, tried to coordinate economic policies with the, uh, all uh, leaders participating at G20. She explained the uh, economic structural reforms which Korean government has made. And also she uh, explained how to uh, promote the creative economies. Lastly, she also uh, discussed um, how to promote the uh, foreign direct investment among the member countries in the region. So she had the uh, 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 many talks about economic uh, issues with the leaders participating in G20 summit. At the APEC summit, uh, she uh, proposed a series of the approaches. Korea has a very unique experience. I mean, we has achieved the very remarkable economic development for the last several decades. So uh, the role of Korean government can play is to strengthen the, uh, I mean, the connections between the developed countries and developing countries in the region. And the, uh, at the ASEAN 3 summit, actually the leaders uh, uh, reviewed the progress of their cooperation in economics and finance and science. Uh, so they have discussed many issues uh, uh, the very intensively. And particularly President Park Geun-hye asked the 
the leaders to uh, uh, issue a collective message to North Korea to give up their nuclear ambition. Uh, she empathized that uh, this is very important for the uh, peace and stability uh, of the reason. So uh, she, uh, I think, are very actively uh, uh, have some exchanges, strengthen the relations with the uh, leaders uh, from the many countries around the world. I yes. think the latter part of, of November was uh, what you may, might call an intensive diplomacy season mm. for many of the global right. leaders, especially the leaders of Asia Pacific area with the G20 and right. uh, ending in um, ASEAN. And uh, it was uh, interesting to see how uh, President Park tailored her messages to each summit because the composition of the members of each summit was different. And mm -hmm. as uh, Professor Shin just um, mentioned, uh, the uh, global nature, the more um, economy focused nature and the regional cooperation, I think that was very um, something to note. Right. Mm -hmm. This year's summit was largely overshadowed by the issue of terrorism, but the econ economic agenda was not put aside completely. Mm -hmm. So the focus of this year's summit was ways to achieve inclusive economy mm. in the region. Mm. And during the summit period, our government mainly focused on the sales diplomacy. Mm. In other words, economic diplomacy. So the topic of economic cooperation among nations was greatly emphasized in those summit. And also the issue of free trade area of the Asia Pacific, FTAAP, mm -hmm. uh, was on the agenda. So was the FTAP also advocated in the summit? Yes, uh, well actually uh, FTAAP was firstly uh, discussed at the uh, summit meeting which was held in Vietnam 2006. Uh, the, uh, since that time on, they, there has been some discussions about how to uh, realize, realizing, how to realize this idea into a real uh, events. Uh, but in 2014, at the summit, APEC summit, actually the Chinese government introduced the so-called Beijing Roadmap for the contribution of the APEC to the uh, launch FTAAP. Well, uh, but, but you know, uh, I mean, this time the Korean government also said that Korea is ready to help uh, the uh, establishment of TAAP, uh, so which means that the Korean government is also uh, uh, very positively considered to join to FTAAP. But uh, I want to uh, talk about the, uh, another aspect which is very important. FTAAP, as I explained before, the Chinese government has taken the initiatives uh, in the implementation of this one. Uh, and the, uh, while the uh, TPP, uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, uh, this is another the uh, initiatives uh, which was uh, supported by the USA government very strongly. Uh, actually, this is the economic integration program in the region. So uh, the USA and Chinese uh, USA government and Chinese government have had the uh, a kind of competition in taking the initiatives in the in the region. I mean, political hegemony power in the region. I think by officially saying, uh, express our support for this uh, this program. Well, Korea has uh, actually uh, taken the uh, well medium uh, path in dealing with the uh, these two uh, initiatives uh, suggested by the USA and China. Yes, President Park already reaffirmed uh, the Korea's willingness to push forward the implementation of the F FTAAP, and it's going to be the one of the largest free trade agreements in the world. And it's difficult to analyze the FTAAP support from our government only from the economic perspective. And we should also consider the political ramifications involving FTAAP. And what, are, what is your thought about that particular Well, matter? Korea has been trying to maintain a delicate balance between its relationship with the U.S. and China because those two economies are critical economies for the um, Korean economy. Um, and so um, Korea had uh, expressed the desire to join the TPP back in April, um, thereby um, announcing firm support for the U.S.-led pact. Um, and also uh, during this meeting, because, uh, because of the TPP, um, APEC uh, seemed to have maybe 
um, paled a bit in, mm -hmm. in terms of its importance because APEC is also an economic pact or economic cooperative uh, arrangement between, uh, between the countries uh, in the Asia Pacific region. And so um, by announcing her firm support for uh, the FTAP, um, Korea once again successful in maintaining sometimes a tactical and sometimes a delicate balance between the two great powers. Yes. During these summits, the dispute between China and the United States was evident. Mm. But thanks to the balanced diplomacy from our government, uh, we were able to get some positive feedback. But what kind of attitude are we talking about specifically? Well, as Professor Lee uh, already explained, in fact, the uh, USA and China, both of them are very important partners and political and economic partners for us. Well, in the reason, you know, our, uh, the USA influences over the last uh, several decades has been very, very uh, huge. But very recently, as we know very well, Chinese influences over the reason has improved very fastly. So I think that, you know, uh, considering the fact that we cannot take on one of them as our uh, the uh, partner, economically or politically, definitely we have to uh, the, uh, uh, take a very well-balanced uh, path in the relationship with them. Uh, but I think the, uh, 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 in this context, I think President Park Geun-hye had played very well, I think, performed very well. Uh, well, the uh, Korea uh, she empathized that USA is the one of the strongest ally for us, and she also uh, strengthened and maintained and strengthened the relationship with President Xi Jinping. So uh, we uh, should take the uh, very pragmatic uh, path in maximizing the uh, our national interest in the relationship with the USA and China. I think. Mm -hmm. I think an example of the successful uh, balance mm -hmm. uh, is displayed by the fact that one of her comments. Um, during her uh, speech was actually accepted in the communique uh, and that um, emphasized that the TPP and the FTAP should uh, focus on integration or economic integration in the area rather than um, trying to uh, compete with each other. And so that was a, a phrase that was mm -hmm. uh, accepted in the final communique. Mm -hmm. All right. On the economic front, the leaders at the summit also noted that the importance of the enabling full participation from all sectors of the society, including women, mm. youth, and small and medium-sized businesses, to achieve the goal of inclusive growth. Mm. And you, two professors explained the matter uh, very well in a successive manner. And one of the achievements at the summit uh, were to get the 2025 APEC summit. The 2025 APEC summit will be held in Korea and it will be our second time to hold the summit uh, in 20 years. And we can say that it is one of the biggest achievements that our government has made during this period. Mm -hmm. And what other accomplishments were made? I think as a whole, the Korean, uh, well, the uh, status or, uh, I mean, actor in the international community has been strengthened. Uh, through this kind of multilateral uh, the, uh, diplomatic uh, the, uh, uh, events. Well, uh, well, as uh, Professor Lee pointed out, uh, President Park Geun has the uh, opinions were included in the communique after the APEC summit. And then also she uh, took the uh, leading uh, role in the uh, our discussion among the uh, leaders. Uh, about various issues, particularly about the economic issues. I think Korea uh, has uh, ta uh, taken quite initi strong initiatives in, in the discussion. And then, as we know very well, the Korean, uh, the uh, well, achievement made by Korean government in terms of the economic structural reforms has been chosen as one of the successful cases at the, uh, 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 the uh, summit meeting. So I think our well, Korea has, uh, I mean, strengthened its status, improved its status in the international arena as a, one of the very active actors, uh, um, I think. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your insights. We have analyzed the outcome of the summit trip, which sparked great interest. Now let's take a look at national issues. Korea joined the Development Assistance Committee on November 25, 2009. 
This is the sixth year of Korea's development assistance. Let's examine the significance and outlook. November 25th has been established as the official development assistance day by our government. Mm -hmm. And Professor Shin, can you tell us more about the development assistance yes. day? Yes, Korea uh, became the member of the OECD DAC, I mean, Development Assistance Committee. Uh, on the uh, November 25th, 2009. So the government celebrated this, this date in the name of the day of ODA Day in Korea. Well, by becoming a member of OECD Day, Korea became a real donor country in the international community. Several months ago, I had the chance to visit, I mean, participate in international conference in London. Uh, at, the, at, at the conference, one economist and participants asked me a question. Korea is not only one uh, the uh, case. I mean, look, uh, Indian government is also providing aid, so we can be another case. But I said, no, the, to become a real donor country, you should not take any foreign aid. But India still take some, I mean, receive some foreign aid. Uh, but Korea officially, we do not take any foreign aid. Uh, we just uh, provide the uh, so aid to the, uh, uh, the countries. So we became the only one case uh, changing its, uh, its status from recipient country to donor country. Yeah. So I think this day is very meaningful. Uh, to uh, Korea is uh, right now one of very active donor countries in the world. Right. It's interesting to note that there are 29 countries in the Development Assistance Committee, and these countries account for over 90% of all the donations made in the world. And mm -hmm. Professor Lee, your comment? Yes. Um, Back in the 1950s and 60s, Korea received grants, just money, um, donations of money. And then uh, it kind of developed into a concession loan country. And it was only in 2000, the year 2000, that Korea actually graduated uh, from being a recipient country. And so um, in just nine years, uh, Korea has become an officially donor country. And that's, I think, a very um, remarkable achievement. Mm -hmm. Right, part very of Korea. important and remarkable day for our mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. And the spectrum of international cooperation continues to broaden in terms of ODA. And in the past, our country's official development assistant was simply comprised of constructing buildings mm -hmm. or implementing uh, ways to boost agriculture, mainly working on one project at a time. But now it changed and focuses on methods of establishing an objective and then integrating the aid accordingly. Let us take a look at the main countries that Korea is granting aid to. There are 19 main countries. And Professor Shin, anything that's impressive to you? Yes, Korean uh, government has chosen the 19 priority partner countries around the world. And among them, there are countries such as Ethiopia, Senegal, and Mongolia, Indonesia, and Peru, and so on and so forth. Uh, the uh, so-called, we can say that the Korean government uh, has used the so-called choose and concentration policy. Uh, for these 19, the priority partner countries, uh, the Korean government has provided tailored aid. Uh, if I give you uh, one example, uh, to Indonesia, the Korean government has focused on the, uh, the providing the aid about the government system, information technology and environment system in Indonesia. In these uh, sectors, the Korean government tried to uh, consent, concentrate on providing aid to these sectors uh, to, for Indonesia. Then if we look at Senegal, we can see that uh, Korea has increased agricultural productivity and uh, helped uh, prevent the desertification of the country. Mm. And so I think it, I mean, very tailored to each country. President Park Geun-hye attended the UN Sustainable Development Summit and the 70th UN General Assembly and stated that Korea will pursue projects to support developing countries worth $200 million mm -hmm. over the next five years under the Better Life for Girls Initiative. Mm -hmm. 
What plans does Korea have for development assistance? Well, in fact, the, uh, before answering your question, I think I have to explain uh, this one. I mean, it's kind of a general trends happening in the international arena. Uh, before, I mean, when we just entered into the uh, new millennium, uh, so our U UN suggested the, a development plan in the name of mil MDGs, mil uh, Millennium Development Goals. Uh, but post uh, the 2015, uh, we right now you use the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, Development Goals, which means, well, in the past, the donor countries presented the just fish mm -hmm. to recipient countries. Right. But right now, we want to teach how to fish. Uh, based on this framework, I think uh, the Korean government right now provide the uh, uh, aid in the name of so-called the uh, uh, New Village Movement, uh, the lessons, implementation of the lessons of New Village Movement. As you know very well, New Village Movement was one of the successful program in Korea to uh, develop the uh, rural area. Mm -hmm. Professor Lee, you had something to add on yes, this? In uh, the proposal for um, the Better Life for Girls movement, I think is in line with that, um, in that Korea is focusing on gender in inequality in those mm -hmm. nations. And so this is an, another topic that Korea is focusing on um, and has declared that Korea will focus on. And so uh, because we have a female president, and so, I mean, globally, it. Uh, also makes uh, Korea um, stand as an important um, country, um, raising important issues. And so um, Korea actually plans to select 15 countries with the lowest gender equality mm -hmm. index and uh, start to provide uh, aid there. The strategic role of ODA is expected to grow. So how should Korea's ODA develop in the future? Um, one of the ways of, of um, providing those countries aid is to um, accept the proposals from uh, either private companies or um, uh, civil society groups um, and selecting the project that uh, is considered to be uh, the most um, amenable to sustain sustainable development. So Korea doesn't just um, send the aid or send the money. Uh, Korea sends the um, people, the knowledge, the infrastructure that will help them build their own sustainable economy. Actually, Korea, uh, we have quite high uh, ratio of uh, soft loans out of total of aid. But I think that this is kind of some uh, a per burden on the uh, recipient countries. So we have to change uh, the structure of the uh, types of aid. And second one is, you know, uh, this one has been pointed out uh, for a long time uh, by the experts, uh, international and domestic experts. Fragmentation of our the ODA uh, governing system. So to improve the efficiency, I think it, it need for, for us to well, make a one governing system dealing with ODA policies. I think this can be one of the uh, uh, tasks which Korean government should achieve in order to improve the efficiency in our ODA policy. Right. If the government subsidies mm. spread among different departments, it mm. would be difficult to yes. have one voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And the ODA is branching out from aiding to investing. And it is time that Korea changes the role and awareness about the ODA. The requirements for online newspapers have been reinforced following the amendment of the press law. This issue has caused a heated debate. It may be a chance to normalize the media, but imposed restrictions may put limitations on reporting. Let's discuss the two arguments. So first of all, the revision reinforcing online newspaper requirements for government registration was included in the press law. What exactly is the revised enforcement ordinance of the Newspaper Act? Yes, the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism has required media companies to provide proof uh, that they are employing five full-time staff members. 
uh, the proof should be in the form of documents such as health insurance and pension. Um, before, uh, the media companies were only required to submit a list of three of their staff members and they would uh, be registered. Of course, these companies are given a year's grace period um, until next November and uh, if they are not able to fulfill their requirements, their registration will be canceled. They are also uh, required to designate a person in charge of juvenile protection. So the, the ministry seems to be putting emphasis on the uh, responsibility and accountability of these uh, organizations. And so basically it signifies a strengthening of the registration requirements for these media companies. Right. The Culture Ministry said the previous requisites for online media registration were too easy. So an average of 1,000 media outlets emerged every year. And the reason this amendment was made has to do with the problems encompassing online media. So we have prepared the content relating to this matter. An article titled Murder Occurs in Suwon Station, along with a picture of a man lying on the floor, quickly spread through social media. Suwon Station was one of the most popular topics on search engines. Media outlets have caused aggravation by reporting on the news before verifying facts. The number of similar cases submitted to the Press Arbitration Commission on Arbitration is remarkably high for online newspapers and internet news services. Data from the last five years show that arbitration in these outlets stands at 55.3%. The flow of applications requesting corrections indicate that the number of false reports being made has been high. Composing reports in this manner is an issue caused by media outlets rather than social media. The frequent surfacing of online media is one issue, but the main problem is that inaccurate reports are spreading. And the Culture Ministry said the revision came from increasing problems with online media, uh, reporting sensational news. And the Culture Ministry hopes that this revision will reduce sensationalism and fake news outlets. And Professor Shin, mm -hmm. what can you pinpoint other problems that are related to online well, media? This kind of dark side of the mass media industry in Korea should be uh, corrected. And there are some pros and cons about the enforcement, new enforcement audience uh, of the uh, new uh, newspaper act. But I think personally, this should be done. I mean, this has more positive aspects than uh, negative aspect, yeah. I think. As far as the number of online media is concerned, mm -hmm. there are over 5,000 online mm -hmm. media registered in the government, but almost 43% uh, of them mm -hmm. never publish a story a year. So that uh, caught the ministry's attention. Uh, but the problem surrounding online media is uh, very critical, as Professor Shin already explained. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, there is strong opposition to the implementation of reinforcing these requirements for online newspapers. Uh, many argue that the restrictions are too standardized, and also the Korean Internet Media Journalists Association uh, issued a statement saying that uh, the government's move is an attempt to control the media, and the statement also says that there's no country in the world that regulates <laughs> registration and publication of the news media based on the number of reporters. What do you think about that argument, Professor Lee? Well, um, the inaccuracies and the sensationalism of online media is a chronic problem. Hmm. Um, the entry barriers um, is very low. Anyone can just start a news site. But if you want to be taken seriously as a journalist as in sight and to be able to provide people with news, um, I think that these news organizations would have to um, be more accountable and take more responsibility. However, uh, the, in the internet world or the, in the ideal internet world, uh, some people say that there is this self-purifying function of the internet. Mm -hmm. Uh, that enables this collective int intellect of crowdsourcing 
to weed out those inaccuracies and these undesirable yeah, stories. And so the people who advocate this um, viewpoint um, say that any attempt to regulate is an attempt to control the media, and that's exactly what the Internet Media Association uh, has said. Um, but uh, if you th think about the um, power of crowdsourcing, back in 2013, um, when we had the Boston bombing incident, um, there was an enormous amount of crowdsourcing trying to find the um, uh, villain. And we, f we saw that there were numerous cases of mi mistaken identity, and that uh, put a, a, an extreme burden on the lives of these individuals. And um, so the value of crowdsourcing actually is one that is being heralded as one of the many advantages of the internet. But we can see that uh, the crowdsourced internet is not always uh, the most um, or the best solution. Uh, so I guess uh, there, is, there is a uh, mandate for the uh, news organizations to try to take a more responsible attitude. Yeah. There are always pros and cons when it comes to government regulation, and especially in the media environment. But the argument against the government regulation says that this is going to kill the internet media, which is big in the public's interest. So we have to go over the arguments one by one. And first of all, the number. Um, the government requires five full-time reporters or editors to be registered uh, as the internet media in the government. But why five? Why not four? Why <laughs> not six? Isn't it arbitrary? What do you think about that number? Well, basically, se? you can say that it is arbitrary. Uh, they raised it from three to five, and they enhanced the registration requirements. Uh, but some are saying, why just five? Why not 10? Mm -hmm. So it is very arbitrary. Uh, but then if you um, see from the other side, uh, now we have um, one-man journalism um, and uh, these many blog sites uh, that uh, talk about current events can also be considered to be providing people with news. And so, um, yes, if you are going to be tried to be registered as a news site, as a journalism site, I think um, the responsibility falls on the um, site to um, try to take a more sort of um, put more effort to uh, produce news stories that are, I guess, that adhere more to the regular or, or uh, existing journalism standards. Yes. The key issue here is government registration. If the media don't want to be registered in the government, they don't have to care about this five mm. people restriction. But if they get the government registration, there are also benefits that the internet media gets from the society or the government, like getting uh, brochures from the government or uh, attending press conferences held by the government. So the issue, key issue is government regulation and registration. But in the end, uh, it is controversial as to whether the effect of improving the media environment will be larger than the damage is brought by the limitations on media content. What are your opinions on this matter, Professor? I think it's damages? a matter of degree, but I personally, I think the, this measure uh, was appropriate. What I mean is, considering the, uh, uh, the uh, bad size uh, of uh, the uh, real online media industry, definitely, uh, I think our, the, um, this measure should be taken because that, you know, mass media, I mean, it's particularly internet media has a very powerful influences over the society, regardless of whether they have the uh, so-called appropriate steps to provide accurate uh, the informations to mass media. So considering the uh, influences of the internet, the way of transport, I mean, tra I mean, reporting the information to the people, 
I think this measure should be taken. I think uh, it's rather too be late in some sense. Oh, Professor Jin seems to think that this <laughs> is pro appropriate government measure. What about you, Professor Lee? I think the potential or detrimental effects of online media can be tremendous uh, because it has the potential to influence uh, a great number of people because of just because of the um, connectedness of the internet. Mm. Uh, but then, if you stop and think um, to realize that there are thousands of news sources on the internet, and only those sources that uh, gain the um, trust um, and uh, good evaluations from their readers will be the ones that will be chosen by the readers. And so, um, well, yes, I mean, we should be aware of and we should um, try to prevent the negative effects of internet journalism. But I would still like to have hope for, I guess, the intellect of Korea mm. <laughs> um, and uh, believe in the power of the uh, crowdsourcing. Yes. And, and one um, more, oh, yes, one please, more please. fact. As uh, at the moment, 5,877 5, registered mm -hmm. uh, internet outlets we have. Right. Among them, 2,572 news outlets which is equivalent to 43.8 percent. Uh, they have not reported a single story in a year. Wow, this is the fact. And then the 25.5 uh, percent out of them did not have a, their own website. So my question is whether they can play as a media uh, appropriately? I don't think so. I mean, this, is, this state, I mean, data gave us, gives us some answer Mm -hmm. Why government uh, takes, uh, I mean, took the, uh, the, this, the measures this time? I mean, say again, of course, like coin, which has two sides, there's good and mm -hmm. bad. But I think uh, considering these figures, I think, well, positive um, and negative, uh, the influences of uh, the uh, fake uh, media outlet is too, too, too big, I think. I think that just speaks for the um, nature of the internet or the um, weeding out nature of the internet because many of those sites actually have, uh, are sites that have closed down, have, mm, uh, that have mm. stopped uh, operating, mm. but are still registered. Mm. So I, I, I guess there is a need to get status of uh, registration in order. Mm. Basically, the amount of online journalism or the stories online is, it, is too enormous to have any um, specific data mm. uh, on that, but uh, there was a study done by the advertising industry on uh, the, the media or the media outlets that are um, the worst, uh, that could be uh, mm. considered the worst in, in terms of the abusing of the stories. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, uh, many of the existing main media uh, were included in that. I see. Yeah. Yeah. One thing we can be sure of is that the awareness of online media and its influence is gradually increasing. So in order for the online media to grow, what kind of efforts should be made? Well, I would like to focus on the term media literacy, mm. which um, signifies the ability of the user to um, analyze um, and even create uh, media content in a variety of format. Um, and so extend that to internet literacy. And so I guess I have a belief in the individual or the um, good of the individual mm. uh, rather than, I mean, I, I agree that we should be very uh, wary of the detrimental effects uh, of online journalism uh, for sure, but um, yes, but I, in the end, I'm hoping that um, human intellect will um, come out as a winner. Yes. <laughs> this has been the discussion on the revision of the Newspaper Act. Let's hope that this lesson aids in the development of online news media in the future. See you on next week's News Insight. Thank you for joining us.